Greetings, everyone. I'm Douglas Eakley, and on behalf of the Rutgers FinTech and Blockchain Collaboratory, I'd like to welcome you to our, uh, our, our session. Our guest speaker today is David McElroy, and I will leave it to my colleague, Professor Yulia Guseva, to introduce him. And then we're off to the questions. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yulia Guseva, Professor of Law at Rutgers, and uh, the director of the program. Together with Doug Eagley, we are running this collaboratory. Uh, and it's my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce David McElroy, who is uh, a barrister, Global Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame in England, who also uh, teaches courses in the United States. And he also is a visiting professor in banking law at Queen Mary University of London. So today, uh, the topic is um, digital asset technologies and UK reforms. So. David, uh, without further ado, please take it away. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. So uh, as uh, Yulia has explained, I, I sort of double hat here. On the one hand, I'm a practicing attorney, uh, trial lawyer, uh, dealing with crypto disputes as they run through the courts. On the other hand, both in my teaching and my professional practice, I have an eye on uh, what is happening in UK regulation in this space. So we're gonna do a sort of past, present and future of the UK's approach to digital financial assets. Um, the first thing to say is that uh, bring your crypto disputes to England. Uh, that is very loud and clear, the message coming from our judiciary and from the Society of Computer Law, Computers and Law and so on. So we have an arbitration scheme, the digital dispute resolution rules, uh, which enable you to, to arbitrate uh, disputes. And one distinct feature of those arbitration rules is the ability for decisions to be implemented on the blockchain. Uh, so uh, that provides a very neat uh, uh, way if you've got parties who are prepared to take their disputes to arbitration uh, to uh, resolve matters. And that's available. It's very heavily supported by Sir Geoffrey Voss, who's one of our most senior uh, judges in the UK uh, who has been involved in the development uh, of those rules and the promotion of those rules. Uh, in the crypto space, many of the disputes that we have seen actually involve people who are complaining that their assets have been uh, stolen or that they've been defrauded or that for some reason or other, either there aren't arbitration rules that are available to them or they don't want to use the arbitration rules that are written into the agreements uh, that they have with the crypto exchanges or wallet providers. In all of those cases, English courts are keen to accept jurisdiction over crypto disputes. I think one of the features of the English courts, they may have this in common with certain jurisdictions in the USA, it is a willingness to take on uh, jurisdiction whenever and wherever possible. So we've got Sir Jeffrey Voss, who I already mentioned, and we've got his honour judge Mark Pelling Casey, who are specialist judges, both of whom are not only giving decisions in crypto cases, but are also making speeches uh, about the current thinking of the courts in relation to crypto. So it's very easy, actually, to find out what the judges in England are thinking, the specialist judges, and to get in front of them. Uh, one of the things that English law prides itself on generally is certainty of outcome. Uh, and compared to some other jurisdictions, I think it's pretty clear uh, how the UK is approaching questions. Particularly valuable for uh, uh, litigants uh, trying to recover the proceeds of fraud are the willingness of English courts to make worldwide freezing orders and to make those orders against persons unknown. Uh, if you want to serve proceedings on somebody who, has, who you think has got crypto that was obtained from you by fraud, you can serve them by NFT uh, in English law. Uh, that's something that the English courts are quite happy with. They say the purpose of service is to bring proceedings to people's attention. And if you can serve somebody by NFT at the relevant wa wallet address, that will be regarded as good service if you've got no other means of serving them. Added to that, the courts are prepared to make ancillary orders requiring disclosure of the identity of holders of crypto assets obtained by fraud. Uh, they're known to English lawyers as bankers' trust orders and Norwich pharmacal orders because of the cases in which 
uh, those orders were first made, but the courts will quite routinely make those and will uh, routinely order service of proceedings outside of England and Wales where the claim involves uh, a claim against a cryptocurrency exchange or wallet provider outside the UK who know either the true identity of the defendant or what has become of the property of the claimant. Not only that, we've got a, uh, a, a good line of cases now dealing with some of the major questions relating to uh, crypto assets, it's established law in England that crypto assets are a uh, type of property. Uh, precisely what type of property they, they are has been something that has been under discussion. Uh, so English law uh, has for centuries rep recognized two kinds of property, things in possession, that's things you can hold, and things in action, which tends to be rights of action and so on. Uh, uh, the Law Commission has proposed that digital assets be recognized as a third kind of property, uh, the classic tertian quid. Uh, that hasn't come in yet, that will need legislation to bring that in, but the fact that English law can't quite work out what kind of property digital assets are isn't preventing the courts from getting on and making orders. Uh, if the Law Commission's proposal is accepted, it will mean that things like bailment and conversion won't apply to digital assets, though. English law is quite happy that crypto assets can be held in trust. Uh, it's uh, settled now on the idea that crypto assets are located in the place of residence of their owner. Originally, it was the place of domicile, but now it's the place of re residence. Uh, but there are two important limits in relation to uh, the uh, willingness uh, and usefulness of English law uh, to uh, bring a claim if your crypto assets have disappeared as a result of fraud. One is, whilst the English courts are really very willing to make interim orders, including these freezing orders, English courts do not make final orders against persons unknown. So if you're still in the position at the end of the day where you cannot work out who it is that now has your crypto, uh, then uh, you may have struggled to get your final order. Uh, that may be less of a problem than you might think, because in most cases, the thing about crypto is it's easy to steal, but it, uh, it's difficult to hide uh, where it's gone in the end. It's on the blockchain somewhere. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, victims of fraud may lose their property in the crypto assets as a result of mixing with other assets. Uh, English law doesn't really uh, recognize a remedial constructive trust on the one hand, and on the other hand, English law is um, quite in favorable, particularly in relation to fungibles, which is what crypto assets, most crypto assets are. Uh, to recognize yeah, the defenses of the holder in va holder for value or uh, um, particularly mixing of funds in a bank account. And the Prusa Day case uh, is one in which uh, what was held to have happened was that the crypto assets had gone into a sort of master account. They'd been mixed with other crypto assets. And so the victim lost their proprietary rights and was simply left with a personal claim against the original fraudster. Uh, that case is interesting because it may be the first signal uh, that we're going to see a sort of assimilation of uh, some of the operations of cryptocurrency exchanges to the way in which courts view how things operate in relation to bank accounts. Um, and um, that also cropped up, I think, in New York. You've had the, the, the ongoing litigation re result relating to the collapse of Celsius uh, and again, the sort of different approaches to uh, ownership of assets, depending on the type of account that the customers had have had uh, with Celsius, it's very likely that English law will uh, uh, be in step with New York law on those kinds of things. I think uh, this is an area where the uh, uh, English courts in particular are keen uh, that so far as possible, we should have harmonious uh, solutions. Uh, and that's especially true and has been historically especially true in relation to um, uh, questions of insolvency. So uh, the first big headline and takeaway from this is bring your crypto disputes in England. That is the that is the message that.
that our judges and regulators uh, all want uh, communicated very uh, clearly. However, cutting against that is another message uh, about consumer protection. So although the UK seeks to be hospitable to crypto disputes, it is a more challenging regulatory environment for crypto exchanges and wallet providers. You got up on screen uh, uh, the definition the UK regulator, the Financial Conduct Authority uses for crypto assets. Uh, you will be familiar with this, I'm sure. Uh, the main purpose of putting up is to flag up that we have uh, one principal financial services regulator, the Financial Conduct Authority. We then have a second regulator, the Potential Regulatory Authority, that's there for banks. But we don't have the multiplicity of overlapping regulators uh, that the USA has. And the structure of UK financial services regulation uh, is under something called the Financial Services Markets Act 2000. Generally speaking, the British are nowhere near as good at codifying their laws as the Americans are, uh, but uh, the Financial Services Markets Act will be one exception to that. That is the, the key piece of legislation that you need to go to. And it is built around two basic ideas. The first basic idea is that regulated financial services activities may only be carried out in the UK by authorised persons. That's called the general prohibition. And the second one is that invitations or inducements to engage in regulated investment activity can only be made by authorised persons or if approved by authorised persons. That's the financial promotion restriction. Now, historically, those two have occupied very similar space. Uh, but what we have seen in relation to crypto assets is the two of those things coming apart. So that so far as the uh, UK is concerned, the current position is that there are, uh, with possibly one limited exception that I'll come to later, no regulated activities relating to crypto assets. So you're not going to be in breach of the general prohibition. But promotion of many types of crypto assets is caught by the financial promotion restriction. And, and this has been given increasing importance because of the war in Ukraine, acting as a crypto asset exchange or as a wallet provider requires registration with the UK regulators for anti-money laundering purposes. And I think part of the reason why we have that anomalous uh, arrangement in the UK is to stop demands on our equivalent of the deposit insurance funds that exist in the US. We have a general sort of financial services compensation scheme that applies if you have lost money uh, dealing with somebody who's carrying out a regulated activity that's caught by the general prohibition. And I think that the UK regulator has not wanted calls on that fund. So that's why we've got the, the approach that's being taken. So uh, for those of you wanting a timeline, uh, the timeline is uh, on the screen now. Uh, it was from the 10th of January 2020 that crypto asset businesses were required to register with the FCA. Uh, on the 6th of January 2021, we saw a ban on cryptocurrency derivatives being sold to regulate to retail clients. That's the one exception to the idea that cryptocurrencies fall outside of regulated activities in the general permission. On the 11th of March 2022, we had a statement from the regulator confirming that sanctions applied to crypto assets. On the 1st of September last year, we had crypto assets being required to keep data on transactions, what's referred to in the jargon as the travel rule. And then on the 8th of October last year, we saw crypto assets being brought within the financial promotion regime. So let's just explore uh, how uh, each one of those things work. So firms which issue or exchange crypto assets have to register with the FCA for the purpose of the money laundering regime. Now, what happened was when that requirement was introduced, we saw a significant pull of the number of crypto asset businesses operating in the UK. Uh, 
there were uh, uh, large numbers of them, uh, perhaps over 100 operating before the registration requirement was introduced. And uh, what they found as they applied for uh, registration with the regulator was that the process was extremely painful. Um, it was painful in particular for Revolut, uh, which was put through the hoops by the regulator and didn't get its uh, permission um, to act until the 28th of September 2022. And we saw the UK regulator pressurizing many businesses to withdraw their applications. So the UK regulator seems to have this preference to get you to withdraw your application if the, if the regulator thinks it's hopeless, rather than to process the application and then tell you no. So one out unnamed applicant reported that the FCA said if we don't withdraw, they would publish a warning notice about us, identifying us and what they see as our faults, which will cripple you with banks and clients and could prejudice your application in other jurisdictions. So of a total of 333 firms that applied for registration, 226 then went on to withdraw their application. That's 72%. And then a further uh, 44 had the applications rejected or refused. So only 45 were successful prior to the 1st of November 2023. PayPal UK made it through in uh, November 2023 itself. Uh, a major complaint by affected crypto asset businesses was that the FCA's supervision and expectation went far beyond what was required to confirm that the businesses were complying with anti-money laundering rules. So what you were finding was that the regulator was saying, in order to be satisfied that you are complying with anti-money laundering rules, we need to be satisfied that your the people running your business are fit and proper. And there are a whole load of other requirements that would normally be imposed uh, if you were a deposit taking institution that were being imposed by the back door uh, by the regulator. Cryptocurrency exchange and wallet providers face criminal prosecutions for breaches of the UK money laundering regulations and the UK sanctions regimes, strict liability for transferring criminal property. Uh, should be noted there, a significant exception is that property is not criminal if it only becomes criminal for the, as a result of the transfer. So it's property that was already the proceeds of crime that is caught uh, by this. Uh, and also no customer has a civil claim for breach of those rules. Uh, secondly, we have the ban on the sale of crypto derivatives. So futures and options and contracts for differences are all regulated investments that fall within the, uh, fall within the scope of the general prohibition. And it doesn't matter if there are uh, futures, options, or contracts for difference relating to crypto assets. So those things, it is illegal to sell at to or market to retail clients. Uh, and that's, that's important. Uh, there are a number of sort of spread betting arrangements uh, and other arrangements that are, are violate that rule. We saw Bybit uh, withdraw from the UK market uh, as a result of this uh, prohibition being introduced. Now, you can still sell crypto derivatives to institutions, to family offices, to certified high net worth individuals, but you cannot uh, market them or sell them uh, to retail clients in the UK. We have new money laundering rules that came in in the last quarter uh, of uh, 2023. Uh, cryptocurrency exchanges based in the UK, that's an important qualification, have to send and record information, date of birth, address, passport number on both the originator and beneficiary of a cryptocurrency transfer. Uh, this, in respect of unhosted wallets, is only required for transactions prevent presenting an elevated risk of illicit finance. Uh, and in a slightly surprising decision, uh, the UK has taken the view that it's domestic uh, politically exposed persons present less of a risk of money laundering than foreign politically exposed persons. Uh, of greatest uh, impact on the market most recently is uh, the financial promotion restriction. And I mentioned how this has expanded beyond 
where the general prohibition sits. Uh, this is the point at which uh, you need specialist legal advice because the uh, financial promotion restriction is complex and evolving. And the way that it works is that there is a general ban on the communication of financial promotions subject to specified exceptions. The restriction does not apply where a person is authorized or if the content of the communication is approved by an authorized person. Now that needs to be uh, qualified slightly because what you've got as a result of the anti-money laundering rules is you've now got this uh, category of uh, crypto asset exchanges which do not have authorization but are registered with the regulator and they are allowed to make promotions. So uh, they're allowed to make promotions. Being allowed to make promotions, there are also substantive rules uh, about uh, what the content of those promotions can be. And on day one, when this rule was introduced, the regulator sent out 146 notices to institutions uh, that it regarded as making promotions that did not comply with this rule. As for what is going to be banned, well, the, the best indication that we have is from the uh, decisions taken by the UK's Advertising Standards Authority. So um, uh, amongst the examples of advertisements that have been sanctioned, were buy Bitcoin with credit card instantly, um, up to 8.5% per annum. Uh, my personal favorite, Papa John's advert, free Bitcoin with every pizza. Uh, five pound in Bitcoin in 2010 would be worth over 100,000 in January 2021. Don't miss out on the next decade. Uh, miss Dogecoin, get flocky. Uh, so we, we see uh, our advertising standards agency in the UK taking action against advertisements which it regards as exploitative, as trivializing the decision to invest in cryptocurrency, or as otherwise misleading. So if you have got uh, authorization or you're registered with the FCA and so you can make uh, promotions of crypto assets, uh, they have to be clear, fair and not misleading they need to include prescribed risk warnings and direct offer financial promotions are only possible to certain categories of customer. Now, what we see here being introduced is a new definition of, of qualifying crypto assets. So you had a few slides earlier, the general definition of crypto assets that the UK uses. Um, the definition of qualifying crypto assets does not include non-fungible crypto assets, it doesn't include non-transferable crypto assets, and it doesn't include electronic money or currency issued by a bank or public authority, which would obviously include a central bank uh, digital currency in due course. Uh, so uh, uh, you'll notice as well the preference in the UK for the term crypto asset over the term cryptocurrency. I think there's a the sort of feeling that um, uh, the crypto assets that are most commonly traded, the Bitcoins and other sorts of things are more akin to digital gold than they are uh, to a proper uh, or fiat uh, currency. Now, the, the new regime that has been introduced uh, categorizes um, investments into mass market investments, which is the sort of thing you would expect a retail customer to be able to understand relatively easily, a non-mass market investment, which is something that's going to be highly illiquid uh, and perhaps not something that a retail customer will necessarily understand. And between those two categories, you have restricted mass market investments. So uh, that is where uh, crypto assets, uh, qualifying crypto assets sit now uh, within the UK regulation. Uh, that they so they're sitting alongside non readily realizable securities, small cap stocks, and so on, and peer to peer lending arrangements, and so on. Uh, it's not impossible to uh, market these things to retail uh, customers, 
but uh, you are going to need, in the case of direct financial promotion, to get the investor to sign a declaration that they're not intending to invest more than 10% of their assets, net assets in these things. Uh, you're going to need to be marketing to high net worth individuals or to people who certify uh, are certified as sophisticated uh, investors. So there is definitely an attempt by the UK regulators to make the, uh, it difficult, uh, harder for people to, to buy these things. There's certain friction uh, that is now built into the system as well, uh, both in terms of risk warnings and in ter which include uh, things like take two minutes to learn more with then a link that is supposed to provide further information about the risks of the particular crypto asset being promoted there's a ban on incentives to invest and there's a cooling off period so first time investors are supposed to be given a 24 hour cooling off period which means they cannot receive their first direct offer financial promotion unless they reconfirm their request to proceed after waiting at least 24 hours uh, so uh all sorts of uh, things uh, that, that have been brought in uh, not to make it impossible, uh, but also but to make it uh, more uh, difficult to introduce more friction into that retail market where, of course, uh, crypto assets uh, started off and have grown and developed. So, uh, on the one hand, the UK is open for business so far as the courts are concerned. On the other hand, we have these increasing restrictions on uh, how. Um, the crypto assets can be marketed, uh, what can be sold, uh, how do those two fit together? Well, the answer is not entirely seamlessly. So uh, Mr. Chiketnin was uh, my client uh, and Mr. Chiketnin was a lawyer who uh, decided during the first lockdown uh, for coronavirus and during the crypto winter, to uh, uh, engage in some betting on what was going to happen to Bitcoin against the US dollar. And he did it through uh, Payward Limited, which is the UK subsidiary of Kraken, a major crypto exchange. And Kraken were offering a service where he could uh, engage in his bets on what was going to happen to Bitcoin against the US dollar on a leverage basis. So he could use he could borrow in fiat for the purposes of betting that Bitcoin was going to move one way, and he could borrow in Bitcoin for the purposes of betting that the movement was going to be the other way. He ended up losing more than half a million pounds as a result of his trades because he thought the crypto winter was going to be more severe than it actually turned out to be. Uh, as a result of that, he. Uh, issued proceedings in the UK alleging that uh, Payward Limited were in breach of various provisions in the UK Financial Services Markets Act, uh, and in particular relating not only to crypto derivatives, uh, but also relating to lending to him as a consumer without a license to do so. Uh, Kraken went off uh, to uh, JAMS and obtained an award from a Californian arbitrator, uh, which completely disregarded all of the UK consumer protection uh, rules. Uh, just ruled he'd entered into a contract, he'd lost the money, what was he complaining about? And what we saw was uh, the uh, un highly unusual outcome that when uh, Payward tried to enforce that award in the UK, a UK High Court judge refused to enforce the arbitral award on public policy grounds. The High Court held that the terms and conditions of the cryptocurrency exchange could not deprive a UK consumer of their right to have the lawfulness of the trading contracts they'd entered into determined in England, uh, preferably by the courts, though the judgment does leave open the possibility that a London seat arbitration would not be unfair. Uh, that case has subsequently resolved. So there's a uh, obvious tension between assertion of universal jurisdiction on the one hand and defense of national consumer protection 
on the other. And that tension is going to be uh, accelerated, I think, because the UK regulation is currently out of step with the European Union's markets in crypto assets regulation. So the EU's markets in crypto assets regulation uh, published last year comes into force uh, fully on the 30th of December 2024. Uh, but uh, we can already see um, a, a couple of early things that are going to happen uh, in June, the rules in relation to stable coins and asset reference cryptocurrencies are going to come into force. Uh, the UK is behind on that, uh, but we can already see the direction of travel. Uh, towards the end of last year, there were a number of uh, policy papers that were published by the UK government. Uh, and I think the intention of the UK government is to move towards bringing crypto assets fully within the scope of financial services regulation. So they will become regulated activities. They will uh, be subject to the general prohibition. But the aim of the UK regulation is not to be quite as prescriptive as the EU's uh, MECA is going to be. Uh, one other thing that's going to be important in this area is for so long as we have a focus on crypto assets being located where their owner uh, resides, uh, we're going to have the phenomenon of uh, fraud and other issues creating a need for claims to be brought in multiple jurisdictions. And the question of enforcement is obviously important given how quickly it's possible to transfer crypto assets. So the UK, on the 12th of January of this year, signed the Hague Convention 2019 on the Enforcement and Recognition of Foreign Judgments in Civil and Commercial Matters. It joins the EU and the Ukraine in doing so, so that restores uh, the ability to enforce a UK judgment uh, in the EU, uh, which uh, had been problematic since Brexit. Uh, the US has signed that convention as well, but has yet to ratify it. We'll see if the US ratifies that convention that will further increase uh, in mutual enforceability of judgments in this space. So I've given you two big themes so far. I want just in my last few minutes just to touch on a, a third one. Stable coins. It is currently unclear whether some stable coins might count as electronic money. So uh, we have what is now in um, technological terms, a really old piece of legislation. The Electronic Money Regulations 2011, which are derived from a 20, 2009 uh, EU directive. Uh, but it's uh, possible, given the definition there, of a, a sort of token that uh, can be exchanged for a fixed amount of fiat currency that some stable coins like Tether uh, and Luna, obviously, before it's cracked, uh, would amount to electronic money within the definition of those regulations. Uh, it's clear, however, that the intention of the rule makers in the EU and the UK is to introduce a specific regulatory regime for stable coins, which will include not only coins pegged to a single currency, but also coins pegged to a basket of fiat currencies and possibly as well uh, coins pegged to certain commodities. Uh, it's currently unclear as well whether some stable coins might amount to crypto derivatives. So some stable coins which are uh, pegged to another uh, stable coin or which are um, stabilized algorithmically, uh, they might amount to crypto derivatives, the promotion of which or the smart sale of which to retail customers is currently illegal. Third area of interest here related to stable coins is the enthusiasm of the uh, UK central bank, the Bank of England, for introducing a uh, central bank digital currency, the digital pound. Uh, this is an area which is definitely exercising uh, the UK public. They had more than 50,000 responses to the consultation uh, that they put out um, with a key concern for respondents to the consultation being privacy. 
there's a definite reluctance on the part of UK consumers to give the central bank access to private data. Uh, the central bank has sought to address that concern by proposing that the central bank has operated core infrastructure would not have access to personal data. Um, and the private sector digital pound wallet providers, payment interface providers and so on would anonymize personal data before transactions are processed and settled by uh, the bank. And there's a commitment from the bank and from the UK government not to pursue government or central bank initiated programmable functions. But I think it's right to say there remains some nervousness about that on the part of uh, the uh, UK consumer. So uh, how do we sum that up? So three things. Firstly, the UK is very definitely open for dealing with disputes related to cryptocurrencies and other crypto assets. Secondly, uh, there's a desire on the part of the regulators to protect consumers that is firstly led to regulation by stealth in the form of this money laundering uh, registration requirement that now led to overt regulation in the forms of restrictions on promotions and is going to lead very shortly, I think, to substantive regulation of uh, crypto assets. It remains to be seen the extent to which they are assimilated to the uh, regulation currently applies to banks. Uh, and there's likely to be a continuing stream of decisions coming out of the UK specialist courts as uh, crypto assets become more and more established as an asset class. Uh, they're already featuring heavily in divorce cases and now throwing up all sorts of interesting questions for tax lawyers as well. Thank you.